Hey there and welcome. We are really starting to wrap up unit one in AP Psych, which is Scientific Foundations. This video is going to be on experiments. So make sure you've got those notes, which are linked below in my TPT store, and let's go ahead and get started. There are a ton of learning targets for this video, but I promise you we can do it and we're gonna do it under a half an hour, okay? That's like my goal. Really 20 minutes would be my goal, but we'll see where we're at, okay? I'm gonna warn you that there are a lot of terms in this set of notes. So what we're gonna do is talk about each of those sets of terms and then really put it together in a picture of what is an experiment. So here we go exploring cause and effect like other sciences experimentation forms really the backbone of research in psychology you you can't just observe your way to a theory you have to manipulate variables and control for other variables that could impact your research to say that this in fact was the cause of what i thought it would have what i thought would happen so example of some famous experiments would be Pavlov salivating dogs, which you see in this image here, um, Milgram's obedience study, which we're going to talk about in the social psych unit, Ash's conformity experiment, also in the social psych unit. And experiments are the only research method. This is absolutely crucial that you get this, and I would highlight it if I were you. It's the only research method that isolates cause and effect. It's the only method that allows you to determine that one variable caused another. We just talked about in the last video how correlations don't do that. You know the variables are related, but you don't know what caused what. In an experiment, you can do that if you do it correctly. Okay, so in an experiment, let's talk about these terms, right? You have a hypothesis, and that's that testable prediction. So let's say in our example experiment, and in your notes, you're kind of jotting down the definition of the terms and then an example. I would encourage you to come up with one on your own, but you're welcome to use this one. Let's say our hypothesis is that caffeine helps keep high school teachers alert and happy. I mean, I guess you could say that with anyone because it's a stimulant. It, it, it is what it is, right? Okay, so you wanna test the effects of caffeine on the behavior of high school teachers. At this point, once you have your hypothesis and know who you want to study on, you're going to create operational definitions of variables in your research, in your experiment. What might those variables be? Well, think of what it is that you are measuring in your experiment. You're going to operationally define how they are going to measure happiness, right? We know that one variable is caffeine we know that the other variable is happiness. You're going to assign caffeine to your groups and then measure how happy they are. So if you're measuring how happy they are, you have to determine how, right? You have to operationally define that variable so that other people can do it the same way you are. So from the last notes, what do we use to measure attitudes, beliefs, preferences, feelings, opinions? I'm hoping this kind of rings a bell for you, and if you need to look back, please do. But in this case, we use a survey. All right, let's talk about who. Who are we going to research on? Well, you've got to have a population. What larger group or category of people are you researching? Well, it's teachers, more specifically teachers at your school or in your regional area, right? That's your population. Let's just say it's at your school. And let's say you have like 250 teachers at your school. Are you gonna conduct an experiment on all of them, giving them either caffeine or decaffeinated drinks? That's a lot, probably not, right? So you do what you do is you get a sample. So just like when you go to buy your your lady friend or your guy friend a bottle of perfume or cologne you want to test some out you don't buy all the bottles test them and then give them one no you get little samples of them right that then represent the bottle <laughs> 
it's the same way in research. Your sample has to represent the bottle that it came from. It has to represent the population that it came from. So it needs to be a representative sample, meaning one that is representative of all people in that population, not just some. So what would that look like in your area? How would you obtain a representative sample? So maybe in your area, it means getting high school, middle school, and elementary. Or if you're only doing high school, it means getting social studies, math, English, science, art, music, all of the above, right? All types of teachers. And how would you obtain that representative sample? Well, you got to make sure that it's random, okay? So a random sample is when everyone in the group everyone in the population has an equal chance of being chosen for the experiment. That's what makes it random. So how would you randomly sample your teachers? Maybe you put all the names in a hat and you draw a good number based on how big your population is. So if you have 200 teachers, let's say you're going to experiment on 50 or 25, something like that, right? Now, there's also something called a stratified sample, and this is where the population is divided into relevant subcategories like social studies, English, math, science, art, music, phys ed, something like that, right? And then a random sample is take from, taken from each of those subcategories, just kind of ensuring even more so that the sample is what it's supposed to be, and that is representative of the population. So you would divide the staff into categories like male, female, by subject, new veteran, etc., and then randomly sample by drawing from a hat again um, from each of those categories. Here's the thing, and this is a key understanding that you have got to make sure you have. We randomly sample in our research so that the sample is representative of the population. So if it's truly random, everyone has an equal opportunity of being chosen if it's truly an equal opportunity of being chosen, that means that it will be representative. So why would we want to do that? Well, researchers need to be able to generalize their findings to the population. They have to say that what is true of this sample is also true of the population. And if all you have is female English teachers in your sample, you can't say that when a good half or a third, let's say, of the population are male, and then everything else is kind of evenly divided on subjects, okay? So that they can say their findings apply to the population, not just the sample. All right, so once you've randomly sampled, you have your participants from the population that you're going to experiment with. Next, you randomly assign. This means that once the sample is obtained, the researcher randomly assigns participants to either the experimental or control group. Assigning participants to experimental and control conditions by random assignment, it minimizes pre-existing differences between the two groups. Okay, it minimizes pre-existing differences between the two groups. So how would you randomly assign your sample? Well, after the participants have gathered, maybe you hand out numbered cards in no particular order um, to separate them into control and experimental groups, something like that. Here's another key understanding you got to make sure you have. We randomly assign. So we talked about why we randomly sample, right? And that's so that it's a representative sample. But why do we randomly assign? It's so that any pre-existing differences between the groups do not impact the results of your experiment. So what could those pre-existing differences be in our experiment? Well, could be caffeine tolerance or experience with caffeine, could be their activity levels or overall health. What if in your experimental group where you are giving them caffeine every day, everybody's already caffeine addicted and so They've built up a tolerance and it doesn't really impact them. That's not really telling you a true understanding of the impact of caffeine then. Okay, so let's back up a little bit and talk about those groups. The experimental group is one that receives what I call the special treatment. Now, here's the thing. That's not something you necessarily write in an FRQ if you're asked about the experimental group, right? It just means that they are given the 
aspect of the independent variable that you are in fact studying, which is caffeine, not no caffeine, caffeine. Whereas, okay, so like, for instance, in group A, let's say that's your experimental group, the participants drink two cups of regular caffeinated coffee every day for a month. Okay, so they actually get the caffeine. Your control group is like your comparison group. You can't just give everyone in your population caffeine because then you have nothing to compare them to on how their alertness and happiness is as compared to without caffeine. And that's why your control group exists to compare. And this group does not receive the quote special treatment. So you could actually have multiple control groups. And in one, you give the participants two cups of decaf coffee, right? Every day for a month. And then in another control group, you actually give them not even coffee. It's just a hot brown coffee flavored water drink for a month. Okay. So that you're not giving them any kind of advantage that might think, make them think that they are getting caffeine. All right, now let's talk about those variables. This is really where people tend to get hung up on which one is which. The independent variable is the cause in that it's independent because it's going to do what it does no matter what. <laughs> That's kind of the way I look at it. Caffeine is going to come in the air and it's going to do what it does. It's independent, right? It's the factor that's manipulated by the experimenter, meaning it's assigned to either the experimental or control group um, and whose effect is being studied. So if I want to know the effects of caffeine, caffeine would be the cause that I'm measuring the effects of. So the type of drink would be our independent variable, caffeinated, decaffeinated, or water in our experiment. The dependent variable is then the effect. It's the factor that may change in response to the independent variable. And in psychology, it is usually a behavior or a mental process, right? Like happiness. So in our experiment, it's their behavior, like alertness, crankiness, et cetera. Um, and remember, how did we operationally define this one? Because when you have your variables, you have to operationally define them. And we said we would give a survey, right? Um, but it could be if it's a, something of alertness, you could give them some kind of test as well. All right. A key understanding here is that both groups actually receive the independent variable. Both the experimental and control group receive the independent variable. That's kind of tricky, but the difference is that they receive degrees of the independent variable. Okay, so group A gets the caffeine. Group B also gets a drink, but no caffeine. Group C gets a drink, but no caffeine. Okay, they each get degrees of the independent variable. Now, a placebo is a huge vocab term. You've got to make sure that you understand. It's the pseudo treatment or fake treatment. Why have a placebo? You're just trying to trick people, right? Well, it's to test the true effects of the independent variable, of the actual treatment. Sometimes beliefs of participants can alter their behavior. So you've got to make sure that you have a fake one in there, not just not giving it to them, right? Like you can't say in group A, experimental group, you guys drink coffee every day. You guys just drink water. You don't need anything. It's fine. Well, they're then going to think, wow, I'm, I'm not getting any caffeine. And they could even feel sluggish, even though they actually aren't. So what is the placebo in our experiment? I've kind of answered that for you. That's in group B and C, where they, they they get decaf coffee or the hot brown coffee flavored water, right? They aren't getting caffeine. Then there's something called the placebo effect. Placebo effect is when the participants don't know they're getting the placebo. They think they are actually getting the pill or the caffeine and they actually have effects as if they are in fact consuming the pill or the caffeine. It's really interesting stuff. And I've linked a video here in the slides, which you can get these slides on my Teachers Pay Teachers store. I highly encourage you to watch that. You could also just YouTube placebo effects. All right, so in our experiment, we, it's humans conducting the research, right? So we have to make sure that we are controlling for bias. And there's a couple ways to do that. One is called a single blind research. This is where the participants don't know if they are getting the real thing or the placebo. They don't know 
which degree of the variable they receive, meaning they don't know if they're in the experimental or control group. So in our research, this would be the teachers, the participants, they don't know which group they're in. They don't know if they're getting caffeine or not. A double blind research is when double two groups of people are quote blind, meaning both the participants and the researchers collecting the information are unaware, right? It's recorded, but they are not consciously aware of which group participants are in. So in this instance, the teachers and the researchers collecting the data don't know which teachers are in which group. Which is better? I'm hoping you see that it's double blind, but why? Well, let's say that I'm the one collecting the research from our teachers who are getting caffeine and I see Mrs. Smith rolling up and I see on my paper that Mrs. Smith doesn't have any caffeine and I'm about to conduct her survey and I'm just gonna say, hey, how you feeling? You all right? Are you tired? Okay, here's your survey. Take, take a seat. That's me kind of like priming her essentially to feel sluggish and that's going to bias her response. All right, confounding variables. We're getting really close to the end here. Confounding variables are other outside variables, outside of your independent variable that could affect the outcome of the experiment. And I'm hoping this puts up a red flag for you because this is not good. Because you want to control your experiment so that only the independent variable is impacting the dependent variable, which is why we randomly assign. I would encourage you to rewind and listen to that again. In an experiment, we control the setting so that only the independent variable is impacting our dependent variable. If outside variables come in, they confound it. They totally make our research null and void, and that's not good. So what could be some confounding variables in our experiment? Well, there's still some caffeine and decaf coffee. That's not good. Um, there's people who have experience with caffeine prior to the experiment, right? So for example, whether or not they're regular coffee or soda drinkers, the amount of sleep they've gotten, how active they are in life, right? All of those could have an impact on your research. So I'll ask the question again, how do we control for those pre-existing differences? I'm hoping that you see it's through random assignment. All right, guys, that wraps up our experiment notes. I would highly encourage you to rewind and watch some parts of this again because it can be kind of tricky, but don't overthink it. Try to simplify it and just know that you're trying to isolate that it's only the independent variable that's impacting your dependent variable so that you can actually say that the independent variable caused the effect. And that's the point of why they do an experiment in the first place. All right, we've got one more set of notes in unit one, Scientific Foundations. So go ahead and click through in the playlist that you've got here and watch that final video. We'll see you then.